All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for tonight's presentation, we have Tori White. Um, Tori White is not a plumber, and thus should it, and thus it could be said, has no business cutting out pipes. Yet her relentless curiosity has driven her to crawl under her home and do exactly that. Tori has built her laundry to landscape system in 2022 and is currently finishing up a permitted branch drain for her shower. Um, aside from independent reading and building, her relevant training has been through Greywater Design Mastery, a comprehensive program taught by Laura Allen of Greywater Action. Her irrelevant training, at least on the topic of Greywater Design, includes a PhD from UC Davis in the field of comparative literature. Tori's presentation tonight is titled Greywater for the Golden State. Luxuriant Sustainability for Native Plant Gardens. Take it away, Tori. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you so much everyone for being here um, on Valentine's Day, no less. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm joining everybody tonight from um, Sacramento, city of Sacramento, which um, is unceded New Zealand lands. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read the land acknowledgement that they've composed um, without any edits. Uh, so we acknowledge that the New Zealand people are still here among us today, though nearly invisible. We understand that we are on New Zealand land that was never ceded, and the original tribal families have yet to recover from the near genocide of their people. As a resident or visitor in Nisanon land, we support the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon tribe in efforts to stabilize their people as well as their campaign to restore federal recognition. Um, and to that end, I wanna not only read the land acknowledgement, but also um, uh, make sure everyone is aware that uh, the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon tribe has a um, very limited window of time um, as an opportunity to uh, recover you know, through purchasing some land, recover um, some ancestral lands of theirs, including um, a village site, a historical village site. So um, if you generally support uh, the recovery of indigenous people's lands under their uh, sovereignty, then I encourage you to donate, particularly if you live on these lands, as I do. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, my teachers right off the bat. Um, some of these folks, like Art Ludwig, I've never met. He doesn't know me, but I've read his books thoroughly. Um, Greywater Action is um, a, a fantastic organization and website you can check out. Laura Allen, as mentioned already, was one of my teachers. Um, and then Dan Tran and Alvin Sirius are folks who have helped me and mentored me along the way. And um, if it's not already in the chat, I hope that we can put into the chat uh, a link to a Google Doc that I compiled um, that contains like the sources for um, some information that I'm sharing or like resources if you're interested in pursuing this further and lots and lots of links. Um, so, you know, for anything that I'm sharing out, there should be a link in that document that, um, you know, where you can follow up on that or explore more. So outline, what are we getting in here into today together? Um, I'm thinking that we start by talking about mindsets around water um, and then we can just get right into it with like, what is gray water? Where does it come from? Uh, and what does all that have to do with native plants? Uh, like native plants is like the reason we're here. So um, that's the really good part, I think. So I'm gonna share um, three ways, three lenses for thinking about that relationship between native plants and gray water. The three lenses are gonna be like a conservation lens, um, a gardening and landscaping lens, and then lastly, a relational or reciprocal lens. And then finally, you know, whatever questions folks may have, I'm here for that. Um, so mindsets, let's talk about mindsets. Um, I want to start by using an analogy, uh, for a concept called stacking functions, um, but pivoting away from water for a moment to talk about fire. So, um, imagine a campfire. We understand that you don't need to have one campfire to have light and then another separate campfire to have heat and warmth, and then another campfire to m prepare dinner, roast hot dogs or something, and then another campfire after that for roasting marshmallows, and then finally, uh, one more campfire for telling ghost stories. We understand that one fire can stack multiple functions. Um, and so we get that. 
when it comes to something like a campfire. And yet I'm going to argue we don't really have that mindset too much when it comes to water. We have more of a zero sum mindset around water. Um, and for those who might not be familiar with that phrase, zero sum, I was told that I should explain this. Um, so a zero sum game or a zero sum situation is something where in order for someone to gain, gain something, someone else must lose. So for example, um, if I win $500 playing poker, which would never happen because I'm really bad at poker, but let's just say I won $500 playing poker, someone or multiple someone's had to lose that money in order for me to gain it. Um, so there's just really, in a zero sum system, there's no way to gain or win without someone else losing. Um, and that is really appropriate for thinking about water when we're thinking about water at this like zoomed out, like community level decision-making um, sort of tier where we're making maybe political or ecological decisions about what water should go where. So, you know, if um, water is being piped to my home here in Sacramento from the Sacramento River or from the American River or from an aquifer, um, if water is being piped into my house, it is not remaining you know, in the groundwater or in rivers and streams for our critically endangered salmon and vice versa. If the water is staying there for the salmon, I don't have it. So, you know, that is a zero sum perspective on water. And um, that is, a, that, as I said, that's appropriate. And I am not going to challenge that sort of perspective about conservation. Like before getting into stacking functions with water, um, it's just really critical that we start with conserving as much water as possible. So everything, like all the best practices that you know about um, using less water, getting like a low um, low flow, like shower head for your shower or um, a water efficient uh, laundry machine. Like those things are still first order of business. Um, and also like this little pie chart here of indoor water use. Um, it's also important for us to start by fixing any leaks. This is like, finding leaks and fixing them is like deeply unsexy and unfun. Uh, I acknowledge that, but like, look, 14% of indoor water use is leaks. That's almost the same as the amount of water that we're using in our faucets and like the bathroom sink or the kitchen sink. So that's a whole lot of water. Um, and so this, I mean, we start here with the zero sum mindset around like, if there's a sliver of this pie that is for the water going to the toilet, that's water that's not going to the washer. Anyway, you get it. That said, once, once water is withdrawn from sort of like the, the ecosystem or from the community, um, you know, re collective resource of water, once it's withdrawn and at my house, um, I have some options for how I can think about that water and how I can um, make use of that water. So that's where this notion of stacking functions um, can begin to come into play. Um, I can, you know, recycle gray water in ways that conserve, you know, both energy, because if I'm conserving water, I'm also conserving energy because water that comes to my house needs to be treated and water that leaves my house needs to be treated before it can go back into the waterway. So conserving water is also conserving energy. Um, so I can, I can recycle water in ways that conserve potable energy or potable water and energy. And I don't have to throw out the bath water with uh, the black water. So I have just used two vocabulary terms here. So it's time for a poll. It's time for a quiz. You didn't know there was going to be a quiz. Um, please pop into the chat here for me. How familiar are you with these terms that I just used? Gray water and black water. I'm going to see when I opened the chat earlier, like my whole thing closed up. So I'm going to see if I can open the chat now. Ah, there it is. Yes. Okay. So please into the chat. Um, let me know, how familiar are you with gray water and black water as concepts and as terms? Option A could be, this is the first time that I'm hearing of this, water in different shades, gray water and black water, didn't know. Uh, option B, I've heard, but I'm not totally sure. Option C, I am so excited, please call on me. I want to share. Can people unmute or is it chat only? Unfortunately, the way we're set up, it's chat only. Okay, right. We went over this. I accept this. Um, okay, so um, 
I see that we've got some folks in here who are like, yeah, call on me. I could, I could define and distinguish these terms for everybody. Um, great. That's wonderful. Love to see it. Um, because I cannot invite you to unmute and share out, I'll go ahead and um, do the explaining here about these terms. Um, and I'll do so by referencing uh, the California code, California plumbing code. So um, for a long time, the use of gray water was not permitted within California code. Um, and when California did a like massive overhaul of the plumbing code in 2009, uh, gray water became um, a part of the picture. And so the code, the California code defines gray water as wastewater that's coming from our washing machines, our showers, our baths, and our bathroom sinks. Um, so gray water, if we're defining gray water, it's water plus whatever went down the drain with the water. Uh, so it could be soap or detergent that could be, you know, hair that you're shedding, uh, skin cells that you're scrubbing off, um, a scab that falls off your knee as you're taking a shower, um, could be, uh, you know, a chapstick that melted um, on the hot setting because you forgot to take the chapstick out of your pocket. Like all that is in the gray water. Um, and so we're, go ahead. Sorry, actually, it looks like I can individually unmute people. So if, um, if people do want to speak, um, maybe say so in the chat and I might be able to unmute you. I have not tried that before, but it looks like I have that ability. Wow. We're learning in real time. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, so Blackwater then um, is defined by the code as wastewater and solids that go with that wastewater from our toilets and from our kitchen sinks. Um, in other states, kitchen sink water is um, permitted as gray water. So that's a gray area when it comes to gray water. Um, but in California, if you're trying to build a permitted system, you're not gonna be able to get a permit to build a, a gray water system for a kitchen sink. So those are our terms here. Um, and then there are multiple types of gray water systems. Um, under the code, you do not need a permit to build a laundry to landscape system. So that's a laundry to landscape system is just one where the, instead of going into the sewer, like on the spin cycle uh, or rinse cycle or spin cycle, the water that's coming out is, you know, pumped by the washing machine's pump out of the washing machine and into the sewer normally. Um, so in a laundry to landscape system, you have the option of either sending it to the sewer or sending it to the landscape. Um, so you don't need a permit to build a system like that in California, as long as you're following certain guidelines. Um, and then from there, there are two sort of classes of permitted systems, simple systems and complex systems. Um, and uh, what you have, the picture that you have here on this slide is a picture of a, it, it's not an actually built system. It's like parts put together, mocked up um, of a gravity fed branched drain. So that's like, I'm, this is what I'm, something that I'm building for my shower. So that this gives me, again, the option of either sending the shower water to the sewer, uh, like normal, or uh, sending my shower water out to the landscape. And it's called a branch drain because that drainage plumbing starts branching and it continues branching and branching so that the water from the shower is not all winding up in one place and becoming a really gross, um, murky mire of dirty water, but is, you know, going to pockets in the landscape. Um, where it can be absorbed and where it can be useful. Um, I'm not really going to talk about branched drains with pumps or filtered systems, and I'm certainly not going to talk about complex systems that might involve, you know, uh, treating the gray water before sending it to the landscape. Um, that has to do with my personal bias. I do not like things to be complicated if they can be simple, you know? Um, if a system can be gravity fed with no electrical components, no pump involved, um, you know, then that means that there are fewer parts of the system that could potentially fail in the long run. So um, I'm, you know, for me, I am most excited about those systems that just kind of, you set them up and then they do their thing after that um, with no changing of filters or, or replacing the pump over time. So I'm, I'm backing up, I guess, to this, I'm, I'm not gonna tonight describe how to build a laundry to landscape system. if if we have time for questions after and you want to talk about like how would I go about building this, happy to consult with you. Um, but there is just a ton of really excellent instruction available 
um, a lot of it for free online. And again, you can, you know, um, consult that list of, you know, sources, resources, and links um, where I've outlined some of those places that you could turn to for instruction on how to build these things. Um, I figure, you know, we're mostly interested in native plants. So, uh, and I don't need to duplicate really great work that's already been done. So I'm gonna share um, more about how I got started with gray water. For me, it all started when I was on the uh, city of Sacramento's like rebate page um, for like river friendly water conservation rebates. And I was there because I wanted to, I had just bought a house and I wanted to rip out the grass and put in a whole bunch of plants some of them native. I had native plants in mind, some of them not. Um, and so I was like checking out these rebates to see if I could qualify for some sort of um, grass conversion rebate. And while I was there, I saw, oh, there's this other little box for a laundry to landscape rebate. Laundry to landscape. What's that? Never heard of it. So that's how I, you know, started on the path of exploring gray water. Um, and so from there, um, I checked out Art Ludwig's book, uh, create an oasis with gray water. I also checked out from the library his DVD, which you know is not a really high production value um, uh, video. But I, for me, it was just really helpful to like see people walking around, putting things together, pointing out things in the landscape. So I got the book and I got the DVD um, from Interlibrary Loan, um, and I read them. And then I found my way to the website for Gray Water Action, and um, I found the a page, the directory that lists people who have training, who, you know, could be helping you design your system or even installing it for you. And it was there that I found, I was like looking for like who in Sacramento builds these things because I'm based in Sacramento. Um, I don't know how to build plumbing, like who, who could make this for me? And I, what I really discovered was that there aren't a ton of people uh, who at least li listed on this website who were doing that. Um, Dan Tran, though, is a, was a um, at the time a master's student at UC Davis, and he was a level one installer. So I was able to connect with him first over Zoom and then in person. And he didn't wind up designing or building anything for me, but he consulted with me. He provided some really great mentorship, and he wound up being someone that I bought some specialty parts from because some of the, while it's all pretty simple, some of the parts are not available at Home Depot, you know. Um, so then I... In March of 2022, I built my laundry landscape, my L2L, uh, and was really just had so much fun with it. Like prior to this project, I had never cut a piece of PVC. Like I was not handy. I was not doing stuff. Um, but then I did this stuff and it was really, um, it was really exciting, was successful. And then I just got, I mean, like it, the system is still going, you know, it's only been a couple of years, but it's still going, still going great. Um, no problems. And um, I thought to myself, I wanna keep going. I wanna keep doing more stuff with gray water. Um, and so that is how I wound up taking a course through um, like a gray water um, design mastery course through uh, gray water action. Um, and it just so happened that my taking of that course overlapped with um, some plumbing disasters that were above, way above my ability to DIY. We had a gas leak, if you can believe. And so we had an actual plumber come out, Alvin. Um, and so, you know, at the same time that I was, you know, chatting with a plumber about stuff going on underneath my home, I was also taking this course and I started to think, what if I did go under my house? You know, what if I just tried it? How hard could it be? Boys do it. Um, and I asked Alvin, you know, like what strategies would you recommend to someone going into like a really, really shallow crawl space? Like, I, it's so, my crawl space is so shallow. I, you can't turn over on your side. It's cause it's just too, not, not, not enough room to do that. Um, so, you know, Alvin told me meditate. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll meditate. So I did, I crawled under my house and, um, cut up some pipes and built a diversion for the shower so that I can either send the wastewater to the sewer like usual or I can send it to the landscape and I'm still building the landscape part, but the under the house work is um, all done. So, you know, no, I'm pretty obsessed with this. I think it's really, um, for me, it's really interesting and fun. I love gardening um, and it turns out I like plumbing too. I would not have predicted that, but you know, here I am celebrating back in March of 2022, the completion of this part of the laundry to landscape diversion. Um, obviously it's not, 
hooked up to the washing machine because I had to move the washing machine in order to build this. Um, but something that I want to highlight is this, um, this lever right here. Um, I've already mentioned that you can either send the water to the sewer like usual or to the landscape. Um, and this little lever is how you do it. So super simple. You just with your hand, turn it up or to the side. Um, and if it's facing up, you know, the water is going to the sewer. It's facing, if it's down, water is going to the garden. Um, and yeah, so you, you can see how like, I, I wish you could also see the washer here, but basically the water comes out of the washer and goes up to this little, can you see my cursor? Goes up to this little like nubbin of PVC right here. And that's how it meets the diversion. And the water is able to travel up like that because it's pumped out of the washing machine. And uh, if I just want to send it to the sewer, it goes up and then it goes back down, down to the sewer. Um, and if it goes out to the garden, it starts going this way. There's a little air admittance here. And then boop, 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 it goes behind me. And then I drilled a hole in my garage wall and that's how it got outside into the landscape. So there's Just that. Unfortunately, we are not seeing your cursor. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. I'm sorry that you can see it, but I hope you still got the picture. Um, yeah. Here's also a picture of um, the diversion for the branch drain for the shower. You can see how um, very little space there is between the crawl space and the ground. Um, but this is um, an arrangement here where, I, again, I did not want to have any electrical components. I, there's an option if you just want to be able to like make the change from sending the water to the sewer to sending the water to the landscape. If you want to do that with the switch, you can like install an actuator on the um, lever and then, you know, the, what, the actual actuator is wired up to a switch that's up in your house. Um, it's all possible. Um, and, but it adds expense and it adds components to the system that could potentially break over time. So I chose to send the water out um, of the crawl space so that I could have access to the, um, to the lever here where the diversion happens. So you can, hopefully you can observe that the water comes out of the crawl space. It comes to this um, diverter here with the lever. And if it's going to the sewer, it just goes back into the crawl space and you know, gravity fed to the sewer as usual. Um, and if I want it to go to the landscape, it does a little like loop-de-loop -loop and starts traveling down gravity fed to the landscape. Gravity fed just meaning there's no pump involved at this point because the water just goes down the drain and then just keeps traveling down the pipe um, with only gravity making it move. Um, and then the part that's like going up and that like at a sort of Dr. Seuss angle up and out of the frame here, um, it's just a vent for the shower. The plumbing needs to be vented. So that goes up to the roof line. Um, and it's painted purple because, go Kings, but also because um, the ABS plastic will degrade in sunlight. So you have to paint it. So that's what you're looking at here. But again, my point for just showing this and describing all of this is just the, to emphasize um, one perspective, my perspective that, you know, that strong bias for having extremely simple designs that, do not have a lot of complex parts. And so there's minimal things that could fail. Okay. What does gray water have to do with native plants though? Uh, native plants is what we're excited about. So um, I promised you three lenses, conservation lens, gardening and landscaping lens, and then relational or reciprocal lens. So just starting from the point of view of thinking about conservation, let's imagine that you love native plants. You don't like to garden, you just like native plants. You just are really excited about uh, you know, doing research on native plants, conserving native plants and the, you know, doing um, habitat restoration, perhaps, I don't know. So from, from just like strictly from a conservation point of view, um, gray water uh, is good for native plants, even if you're not using the gray water to irrigate native plants, because you're using, you're, you're withdrawing less water from the collective resource in order to irrigate your landscape. So you're leaving more water in the rivers and streams and aquifers. So, you know, habitats, ecosystems um, are less disturbed and, you know, that benefits the plants. It benefits, you know, the salmon. There's a picture here of my daughter holding up a salmon skeleton, um, you know, leaving more, I've already mentioned the salmon a bunch, but like leaving more water in the river for them uh, helps them out. And then more like having the salmon persist in the river, uh, you know, is, is so vital. The you know, keystone, keystone species are so vital for the whole habitat when they um, ethically return and die, you know, their bodies um, provide so much um, 
you know, fertilizer for lack of a better word to the environment. So just from a conservation point of view, gray water is worthwhile. Um, and uh, thinking about gray water helps sort of break down some of the ways that we use water that are normalized, but completely bizarre. So like, for example, when you think about it, it's totally weird to like treat water to make sure that it's potable water and then use that potable water to flush the toilet. That's so odd. Why do we do that? Um, I just, I didn't put this on the slide, but I, right before we started, I looked up um, the, like how much of the water on the planet is fresh water. So here it is, 97% uh, of the water on the planet is salt water. Um, another 2.5% of the water on the planet is frozen fresh water for now. Um, so that means that 0.5%, uh, so half of 1% of the water on the planet is available fresh water. So just such a precious, precious resource that we're using to flush our toilets. That's strange. So, you know, there are multiple ways. You don't necessarily have to build an L2L laundry to landscape or a branch drain or something like that in order to incorporate gray water use in a way that would, uh, you know, lower your use of water overall, the amount of water that you're withdrawing overall. So I've got some pictures here. One is of, um, you know, someone taking a shower outside. You don't have to build a branch drain if you're just already outside taking the shower and the water, you know, um, is drained into the landscape right there. So that's, that's one way. Um, it, it, this time of year, it is not appealing to me to take a, a shower outside. Um, but you know, maybe in summer that would, that would feel, uh, better. Um, then in the top right over here, we've got this little sink. Anyone familiar with what this sink is just looking at it? This is another quiz. Anyone want to tell us what this is in the chat? What's this white sink thing? Anybody know? Okay. Outdoor sink. It looks kind of like an outdoor sink, but it's not. Thank you for playing. Anybody else want to try? I will not be insufferable. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Yes, thank you. It's an over the toilet tank. It's this um, particular brand uh, is called Sink Twice. And again, there's a link for that in the, um, the Google Doc that I've shared with you. Um, so basically what this does is the fresh water that's pumped into the toilet goes first through this sink apparatus on its way down into um, the tank. And so just to refresh all our memories on how toilet flushing works. Um, oh, Rachel, I see that you want the Google Doc. It's I'm sure it'll be in the chat in just a moment. Um, but just to refresh all our memories on how toilets work, when you flush water, like when you flush the toilet, you, you're using gravity to send water that was in the tank down into the toilet real fast to flush it out of there. And then the fresh water that's coming in refills that tank and it just sits there until the next time that we are using it. So what this sink twice contraption allows you to do is when that fresh water is coming in, it just automatically is like sort of piping through that little faucet. Um, you know, whether or not you're going to wash your hands, I hope we all are washing our hands after we use the restroom, but it just automatically is doing that. Um, and so you can take advantage of that moment to wash your hands real quick. There's a little soap spot there. Um, so you wash up your hands and then that gray water from your hand washing is what sits in the tank until the next time you flush. So you're, you know, with this, you know, just putting this one thing on top that, you know, connects obviously to the, um, water that's pumped into our homes. Um, putting this on top of your toilet allows you to, you know, use less water because you're, you know, the water that you're using to wash your hands this time is water that's going to flush the toilet next time. I hope I didn't belabor that. I hope that made sense and was not tedious. Um, and then also here on the bottom, um, you know, I, I, we've got a picture of someone using a hose to uh, fill up a an igloo outdoor wash station. And I included this because I know a lot of people like to, um, like my mom, for example, loves to keep a bucket in the shower. And she's like completely committed to this. She's been doing this for years. She also keeps like a little basin in her bathroom sink. So that whenever she washes her hands, the water is going into the little basin and she uses that water to flush the toilet and, you know, water that she's collecting in the shower while she's waiting for the shower to heat up. She uses that water to flush the toilet also. Um, that's cool that she does that. Good for her. Um, but 
that's not even really the, the shower one is not even really a gray water situation because you're capturing potable water. So another way that you could stack functions is while the shower or bath is running to get warm and that potable water is going down the drain, you could stick a bucket, a hand washing station underneath it. You could capture that water and that could be water that you drink or that your um, animals might drink or water that you might use to wash your hands or wash dishes. So, you know, again, these are ways of incorporating gray water um, so that we conserve more water, use less of that resource overall. Um, for me, I love all of these. I particularly, I want to get that over the toilet sink twice contraption. I keep meaning to get that. Haven't gotten it yet. Um, I think these are cool. Um, for me, a difficulty here is that um, I just am not, I'm not my mom. I'm not going to stick. I'm not going to commit to the bit and continue to put the bucket in the shower, fill it up and, and manually flush the toilet. Like that's just like extra steps that I'm not gonna be taking on a regular basis. So um, they're very cool. Um, and if they work for you as they work for my mom, then full speed ahead, go for it for me. Um, and I think in general, the gray water strategies that tend to work the best are the ones that do not involve changes to our habits. Like it takes some effort to put it together, but then once it's set up, you go on with life as usual without major changes to like the way that you are doing things day to day. I mean, that's like the real genius of for something like a laundry to landscape system is that, you know, once you've done that weekend long project of building it out, does it itself from now on. Um, no schlepping buckets around or anything like that. So um, before we carry on, I have one more thing that before we carry on and talk about like the gardening side of things, one more thing that I want to say about conservation. Um, and it's about rain barrels. And this is not going to be... Um, I'm not here to disparage rain barrels. I have um, a system of seven linked rain barrels um, built on the design by Blue Barrel Systems. The link to that is also in that, the link to their website is also in that list of um, resources and links. Um, so I love capturing rainwater, huge fan. Um, but you'll see here that the city of Sacramento has a rebate of up to $150 for rain barrels. Um, while the rebate for laundry to landscape was only hundred dollars. And so that got me thinking about, you know, sort of like the, the monetary value versus the, um, impact at the level of water conserved or water, you know, uh, directed to the landscape. So let's do, let's do a word problem, a math word problem. Join me. Um, so let's say that we have the very best, most high efficiency washing machine out there, one that uses only seven gallons per load. I do not have such an efficient uh, washing machine, um, but let's say we do is have like the very best one. Um, and let's say that we're an average, apparently average American family, and we do 300 loads of laundry per year. This seems wild to me. I don't think I'm doing 300 loads of laundry per year and I have two kids. So I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or if I'm underestimating how much laundry I'm doing. But apparently an average family is doing 300 loads of laundry per year, um, according to um, sources cited in that, in that resource page. So that's adding up to uh, you know, 2,100 gallons of water that could be going to the landscape. So it's you know, over the course of a year, over 2,000 gallons of water could be sent to the landscape and therefore not withdrawn from the fresh potable, potable municipal water. Um, sort of collective pot. Um, and let's compare that to like, you know, your average um, rain barrel that can store around 55 gallons of water. I have, as I said, seven of these. So I have like 300 and something. I'm not doing the math off the top of my head there. If you are excited to do the calculation of 55 times seven, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, but you know, that's, that's a obviously much smaller amount of water that is, um, you know, captured rainwater and therefore wa not water that we're withdrawing from the collective municipal water source. So again, you know, I'm not suggesting that we need to throw the rainwater out with the black water. I'm just making a comparison here about like impact. Um, and rain barrels are cool and I love mine, but laundry to landscape tends to be a much more powerful impact. And like, if, if you like me do not have the most high efficiency washing machine, that's even more water that's currently going to the sewer that could be 
going to the landscape and therefore lowering the amount of water that we're using to irrigate our gardens and our landscapes. Okay, let's get into the gardening part. Let's think about gray water and native plants from a gardening lens. Um, in general, gray water is best for irrigating fruit trees, shrubs, and some smaller plants. Um, this is because, well, no, I'll, I'll, in a moment I'll say why. Um, for now I'll say uh, that like those are things that you can, oh my God, my slides are jumping all around. Here's a little video, bear with me. So that's, that's the water coming out of the washing machine and going into the landscape there. So I'll take advantage of this little accidental clicking ahead to say, you know, that's, that's how it can work in the landscape there. And this, this is like one way that the water can be going out is into like what, I hope you can see that on the top right, um, not yet completely covered up and buried is like a turquoise gray water line going along next to like a trench filled with wood chips. And in that trench, there are the wood chips and there's also um, an overturned one gallon like nursery container um, that I like cut up a little bit so that it could be like sort of the receptacle for water coming out of the gray water line. So water can go into like a small little like one gallon sort of uh, open bottom container that's embedded in the ground as in the little video or it can go into a longer trench or basin or like semicircle. Or if you're trying to irrigate smaller plants, you can use Laura Allen's design here where you create a mulch basin that's like sort of star or sun shaped. Um, and that can be how you're getting um, getting the irrigation, the, the, the gray water to work for smaller plants. So let me see if I can go back here. The like slides are kind of only letting me go forward. There we go. Okay, so so th those are some ways that gray water can work. Some ways to not try to make gray water work. Some gray water no-nos would be, um, you don't want the gray water to be pooling anywhere. That's a health hazard because gray water contains pathogens. So, you know, here's a picture of my, um, a part of my garden super flooded during our major weather events of January, 2023. Um, so at that time, I was not sending my laundry water to the landscape where, you know, it could create like a dangerous puddle of pathogens. I was sending it to the sewer at that time. You, so you, you just don't want any situation in which people or animals would be having direct contact with the water. Um, you do not want the gray water to go into storm drains or waterways. Um, that's how you can end up with these like algae blooms because there's like too much nitrogen in that water. Um, and that can make, you know, like, I don't know if you've been to Clear Lake in the past few years, but like Clear Lake has like those, that weird algae growing on the top, um, that, that kind of situation is made worse by, uh, you know, excess nitrogen in the water, um, feeding that algae and then killing off fish. So we do not want to be sending that excess nitrogen into storm drains or waterways. We do not want to be storing gray water for more than 24 hours because at that point it starts to become black water it starts to become really disgusting uh so we're not you're not keeping it at a tank somewhere you're sending it directly out to the landscape um, where it can immediately percolate into the soil and be of use to plants um, and we're not irrigating root crops um, we're not irrigating roots that we're going to eat because that's a way to make ourselves sick so we're not doing that um okay so those are the no-nos and then we've seen this already. These are different kinds of basins where the water can be coming out of the gray water line and, and irrigating. Um, okay, we're not gonna watch that again. Okay, so then now the question is what kinds of native plants can be irrigated with irrigated with gray water? And the answer is so many. So many native plants um, would appreciate and enjoy some gray water. Um, I have had personal successes with narrow leaf milkweed, showy milkweed, California poppies, lupins, yarrow, and California hibiscus. And this picture that you see on this slide is my kindergartner uh, wearing her monarch butterfly costume next to a towering showy milkweed, um, which at that moment had monarch caterpillars on it. Ooh, it was so fun and beautiful. So um, milkweed, they love gray water. It works out. Um, I'm not gonna just list out loud for you every single native plant that likes gray water because it's a lot um but you know there are lists 
posted to that Google Doc that you can explore where you can get ideas for different trees, shrubs, berries, love, gray water. They go, they become explosive with gray water. Um, grasses, sedges, ground covers, all kinds of, you know, different sorts of plants that appreciate um, gray water, which is just like water, is like water that has good stuff in it from a plant's point of view. Um, okay, and now I'm gonna assume that someone on this Zoom call was thinking, huh, I have a redwood in my backyard that I did not plant that is not doing well because coastal redwoods do not want to live in the valley. Um, so could I use gray water to irrigate my redwood tree or trees? Um, and there's some like mixed opinions on this. Um, in some gray water forums, you know, so forums that are sort of like Reddit forums where you know, it's just folks talking to other folks um, about topics of shared interest. Um, some gray water forums, you know, have people in them sharing anecdotally that it worked for me for decades. My family has irrigated our coastal redwoods with our washing machine water and they're doing just fine. Um, there's also though a study um, from a few years ago suggesting that uh, we might wanna have some caution when it comes to irrigating long lived trees, conifers with gray water. It has largely to do with like leaf tip burn and just like overall the salinity of um, potential salinity of gray water. Um, I'm not like dumping salt into my load of laundry when I'm doing laundry. However, our, many of our detergents contain um, some or multiple forms of sodium in them. Um, obviously some detergents contain like, you know, Clorox bleach, which would obviously be disastrous for plants or boron, which is real bad for the plants. So like, you would want like an eco eco friendly sort of detergent, but even those eco friendly detergents might still have multiple forms of sodium in them, um, which you know is like natural and therefore eco friendly. But over time, the accretion of those salts um, can be scalding for plant roots and for for leaf tips. So um, I personally, I was using pr prior to installing the laundry landscape system, I was using just like a laundry detergent from Costco, like a lavender scented laundry detergent. Um, and, you know, when I made the switch, I read the label closely and saw, oh my gosh, this has four different kinds of sodium in it. So um, I switched over to Ecos brand detergent, which has one kind of sodium in it, and I'm still able to get it at Costco. Um, so, you know, it's been going on two years that I've had my laundry landscape system in, and I have not noticed my plants at all minding, um, you know, the sodium in the, the small amount of sodium in the detergent and like the sodium that comes off of our bodies. Like, you know, you put a sweaty, after a day of gardening, you put you, your sweaty clothes into the washing machine. Those salts in our sweat, you know, also can accrete over time. But um, some plants are really sensitive to that. Like apparently avocados are extremely sensitive to salts. Um, all that to say, redwoods, do they mine the gray water? Um, it seems like Overall, gray like uh, redwoods planted in the valley are already kind of hurting a lot of them because this is not an environment that they're adapted to be living in. It's much drier and hotter, uh, so they're already having a hard time. It seems to me like it the gray water might be a lesser evil than the dryness of the valley. So if I had, I don't have redwoods. If I had redwoods, I would give the thirsty tree some gray water. Um, but you do you, you know, do your own research. Your mileage may vary. Um, but I think I just wanted to bring up those redwoods because redwoods do come up from time to time as a hot topic, uh, you know, for the valley. Okay. Um, one more thing I want to say about gray water and landscaping is that um, gray water has proven to be beneficial to plants and to landscapes um, that can, you know, that are affected by fire. So, you know, a great example of this is the Evergreen Lodge um, near Yosemite that was impacted by the 2013 Rim Fire. We have the landscaper, Regina Hirsch, describing that, you know, after a few months of being away, she was assuming that like all plants would either be burned up or just dried up and dead. And she observed that out of 1500 plants, 90% of the plants irrigated with potable water were indeed dead. 
uh, but less than 5% of the gray water irrigated plants had died. So um, that's a really powerful testimony to um, the way that gray water, you know, provides like, you know, benefits to plants. It also can alleviate soil compaction. So it's really, it's doing so much to nourish the soil um, biota and, um, and that in turn is nourishing the plants. So if you're, I mean, like I live in Sacramento, if a fire came through my neighborhood, that would be unusual and um, quite disastrous. Uh, so I'm not thinking about, I'm not a gardener who's thinking about firescaping, but if you are a gardener or landscaper who, you know, lives in, you know, a fire sensitive area, gray water might be of particular interest to you um, as it can help protect your landscape and, and also potentially be protecting you as well from fire. Um, okay. I really appreciated this article or this opinion piece um, from Chris Miller uh, in the, the LA Times plant section a few months ago. Um, and I think this will resonate with a lot of us who care about native plants. He's saying like, it's not like a, a, a landscape that is drought tolerant is perfectly fine, except there's still the problem that like exotic plants are not serving as lifeboats for California's natural biodiversity. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of like, sterile wasteland might be too strong of a word because I do observe, like, I think we all observe like butterflies using, uh, you know, zinnias as nectar plants. Zinnias are not native to Sacramento Valley. Um, so I don't want to say that like non-native, I'm like, I have non-native plants behind me and, um, we've got some sunflowers and zinnias behind me in my, um, background here. So, I mean, like, I, I, I don't exclusively plant native plants, but, um, you know, thinking about, gardens and landscapes that support, uh, that, that, not, that not only minimize the use of water, but also support um, our biodiversity. It's like such an important thing to be considering. And th that is how I'm gonna pivot to talking about our beloved California hibiscus here, because I've had a lot of conversations with gardeners in uh, my area who um, are delighted with our native hibiscus, think it's a lovely flower, but aren't planting it because she's thirsty. She's a thirsty flower. Um, she's used to a floodplain. Um, and so, you know, she's a water hog. Uh, so even though she's native, you know, I, I hear of folks not planting this plant because, uh, because of that water conservation lens. Um, and so I want to encourage us to think about how uh, gray water can facilitate um, sharing water with this, you know, precious, um, endangered uh, hibiscus that we have. And it, the picture that I have here is a screenshot of a reel um, from Instagram by Michelle Fulner, who was, I know, uh, the last person to to present to this group. Um, and I mean, this is a great reel. I highly recommend, like, if you don't follow her on Instagram or TikTok, I re recommend it. She's very cool. Um, but here she is, you know, in this reel thinking about you know, she's imagining what Cal what the what the valley used to be like um, before colonization, and what it could one day be like again. Um, you know what what we could do to make the valley hospitable to this native plant once again. Um, and I'm I'm what I want to argue is that gray water bridges that gap. You know, gray water is a way of conserving water while also creating little micro, uh, you know, floodplains, I not floodplains because we don't want the gray water to flood in our backyard, but we're creating little habitats that are consistently moist and therefore able to support um, this, this hibiscus that needs more water. So um, I, and uh, the picture that I had at the start of this uh, presentation and this picture here, these are both of hibiscus growing in my own water, in my own garden on the gray water line and they love it. It's working out. So um, I, if you love this hibiscus, give it some gray water. That's what I want to say about that. Okay, one more lens that I want to think about is the reciprocal or relational lens. Um, I know a lot of us are familiar with Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, and, you know, a, a quote from this, this book by her um, is one where she's talking about this notion of reciprocity, like reciprocity, the give and take with the land. And um, that I think of gray water in that way. I think of gray water as a way of 
um, being in right relation, being in more intimate relation to the land um, and to the watershed um, and, and being more a part of the ecosystem. So um, on this slide, I have a picture of me doing some laundry. Please pay no attention to how dirty my washing machine is. Um, but here I am doing some laundry with captured rainwater. Um, and so it's rainwater that I briefly caught to do my laundry and that I'm releasing to the landscape. And um, I don't do that with every load, right? Because it's kind of a whole bother to connect the hose and set it up. But whenever I do do that, I get, I have this opportunity to think about how this water is brief. This water is not mine. It's not a commodity that I'm purchasing, but it's something precious that I'm holding for a moment, using for my needs and then returning um, to the ecosystem, to the landscape. So I did not leave a lot of time for questions. We got to wrap it up here, gang. Um, but you know, if you have any questions, I'm happy to hang back and answer. Um, and I also have some suggestions for things we might do moving forward. You know, think and talk about gray water, spread the word, let people know. Um, you know, maybe visit an existing gray water system. If you know of someone that has a laundry to landscape or branch drain, go check it out. Um, try building your own or consult with a plumber to help you build one. Um, and if you happen to be a plumber, or if you know someone who's a plumber, encourage them or encourage yourself to um, to do the gray water action installers course where you can be someone who's like certified to do this and listed on that website, someone that other people could contact to get support. So speaking of visiting a um, visiting a existing system, you know, uh, my garden is it's not a garden. This is not a garden tour in competition with Gardens Gone Native. We can visit multiple garden tours. Um, and so if you want to see my setup for the laundry landscape and the branch drain, um, come to the Colonial Heights Garden Tour on May 5th and um, check it out. So that's all. Thank you so much. Well, their garden tour logo looks to include only native plants. So that's a bonus. <laughs> oh, I see your comment, Leslie, that hibiscus is used to the tidally influenced waters. Yeah. Yeah. Used to some salt. That makes sense. Yeah, that was great. Um, we did get one question, um, and we kind of touched on that with the um, over toilet tank uh, sink idea, um, but somebody was asking um, if you were going to talk about how gray water could be used in toilets, and I think you did kind of touch on that. Um, I don't know who, it doesn't tell me who asked this question, but if you are still there, if you wanted to raise your hand, I think I can allow you to talk and ask your if you had a specific question. Maybe it was answered. Okay. Oh, Rachel, thanks. Cool. Cool. Well, if anyone has any other questions, um, you know, uh, feel free to. I, I made the that list of resources, um, a Google Doc that you could comment on. So if you have a question about something there, or if you have an, a suggestion of something that I might add to that list, please comment um, and let me know. Um, or come to the garden tour. I'd love to connect. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Tori. Um, I actually had a quick question. Um, Ooh. I was just wondering, do you, um, do you water your yard with, um, potable water in addition to the gray water that you use? Yeah. So I mean, I have like a drip line, um, for some different sections of my garden that are like either too far away um, or just like things that could not be irrigated with gray water. Like I would not want to irrigate lettuce with gray water. It's not a root crop, but like icky. Um, so like I have, I have more things going on than just the gray water, um, situation. Um, also gray water doesn't go through a drip line. Like a drip line will get clogged up with all that lint and the paper clip left in the pocket and so on. So the openings for a gray water line are bigger um, than like a drip line opening. So like for, I have some raised beds with like vegetables and stuff more zinnias because I love my cut flowers. Um, so those are irrigated with municipal water or by hand with rainwater for as long as that lasts into the summer. I tend to conserve the rainwater for those avocados that are reportedly fussy about salts. Yeah, I was just thinking for like in my own yard, um, you know, I really don't do much supplemental watering um, throughout the summer. 
Um, I, I am on clay soil, so, you know, my soil retains moisture pretty well, but I also would wonder if I'm only irrigating with gray water, if those salts would build up fairly quickly. Um, and, you know, we have had pretty good winter rains the last two years. So I wonder, you know, there, there probably is some flushing um, during winter rains, which, you know, in drought conditions, maybe we, you know, that might become more of an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think gray water becomes, you, you got to be more careful with your use of gray water. If you live in like a truly arid or desert climate where there is not going to be like rainwater flushing out those salts, but, um, but yeah, I mean, at least for the past few years, as you said, we've, we've had that rainwater come through yeah. too much. Some would say. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, everybody, I hope you had a good time and um, learned something from this presentation. We thank you for joining us tonight and wish everybody happy Valentine's Day and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks.